I was scrolling through the comments of my last video and I came across a suggestion by one of you who suggested I do a video about transcontinental countries. I had a video idea already scheduled for this week but I liked this suggestion so much that I decided to just do it now. So this is what we're going to talk about in this video, transcontinental countries, meaning countries that exist on two continents. First, what's the technical definition of a transcontinental or intercontinental country? It's a country that has at least some portion of its territory geographically divided between at least two different continents. But we need to differentiate between the various types of transcontinental countries that exist. This map illustrates these differences well. The ones in the darker blue are the true transcontinental nations in the absolute sense of the word, meaning their contiguous territory goes across two continents, and there are only a reduced number of them in the world. Panama, Egypt, Turkey, Russia, and Kazakhstan, at least according to this. Then we have the non-contiguous transcontinental countries in the slightly lighter blue but still dark, like the United States, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, or the United Kingdom, as well as Yemen, Australia, or Indonesia. These are countries whose territory is not contiguously placed across two continents, but which control territory despite separated in two or more continents. And then in very light blue, countries that may be considered transcontinental depending on the legal status of their claims or the definition of continental boundaries used, which sometimes varies. The amount of continents there are also varies depending on who you ask. For the purposes of this video, and because it is what I think makes sense, we're going to assume that there are seven continents. Africa, Asia, Oceania, Antarctica, Europe, North America, and South America. So let's start by the perfectly transcontinental countries, the ones on the thumbnail plus a couple more. Starting with Panama. Panama is divided between North and South America. Since the political boundary between Panama and Colombia is not fully determined by natural features, some geographers prefer to use the Panama Canal as the physical boundary between North and South America. But it's not because of the canal existing that the country is in both continents. It would always be the divisive area between the two. So the only question we can really ask is why Panama exists and why their borders are where they are. Why Costa Rica didn't just go down to the North American limit while Colombia went up to the South America limit. Well, in Colombia's case, it kind of did. Panama used to be a part of Colombia, Gran Colombia, in fact, and its independence is very much connected with the building of the canal itself. Johnny Harris did a fantastic video about this, which you should definitely check out. I will link it in the description. Essentially, in a very summed up way, the US wanted to build a canal, Colombia didn't let them, so they helped Panama locals gain independence in exchange for the authorization to use their territory to open a path between the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Oceans. Then Egypt, which oddly enough is also divided by a canal, the Suez Canal. But here there's no connection to it, not even indirectly as there was in Panama's case. It seems that most of the times when it was independent throughout history, Egypt apparently always ruled this area. Even during the times of the Ptolemaic Kingdom, in around 200 BC, they already held control of it. In this map from the Muhammad Ali dynasty, we can see that even before the initial conquests up to 1840, Egypt already had a foothold in the Sinai Desert, making it a transcontinental country. The fact that the Egyptian civilization has always been concentrated along the Nile, and the fact that to their west is the Libyan desert, makes it so that their only logical and possible path for expansion would be towards the east, more specifically the Middle East, joining African and Asian territorial control. An interesting fact, after the Yom Kippur War of October 1973, Israel briefly became a transcontinental state as well, as it occupied territory on the African side of the Suez Canal. The land was returned to Egypt two years later in 1973. And moving slightly north, Turkey. 97% of Turkey is Anatolia in Western Asia, while the remaining 3% of its territory is in the Balkans in Europe, a region known as East Thrace. But it represents far more than just 3% of the country's population, 14%, in fact, totaling at 11 million people. Turkey not only has its territory in Europe and Asia at the same time, but its own capital of Istanbul is also divided between the two continents on the Bosporus Strait, a tremendously strategic location which conditions access to and from the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. The situation happens with Turkey as it did with their predecessor, the Ottoman Empire, and their predecessors, the Byzantine slash Eastern Roman empires. With the same capital, at the time being known as Constantinople, and previously Byzantium also being divided. Although technically, Constantinople was initially only on the northern shore of the strait, being much smaller than today's Istanbul. The initial reason for this transcontinental feature was simply Roman expansion into the east as a part of their empire. The Romans conquered Thrace in around 200 BC and claimed Anatolia in 129 BC, establishing their province of Asia Minor. Eventually, their domain became exclusive to the eastern part of the empire 
Empire, then the Byzantines, and eventually being conquered by the Ottomans, which took the inverted path of conquest, first taking Anatolia and then moving towards the Balkans, with modern Turkey having been able to maintain their hold of that territory and the country's transcontinental feature. But before we keep going with the video, a quick message from today's sponsor, NordVPN. If you are online, that means there is an ever-present risk your information is being exposed to companies and people that have no business knowing about you. With NordVPN, you can make sure that all your personal data is 100% secured, using single or even double encryption. On top of that, you get to benefit from two features that set NordVPN apart from all the other VPNs out there. First, NordVPN is the fastest VPN. With over 5,300 servers worldwide, it also removes any type of speed limitations your internet provider may have applied to you. And also, with NordVPN, you can access the internet as people do from almost anywhere in the world. This will allow you to access the content of streaming services from other countries or even escape any type of censorship where you live. You can use it on all your devices, at home, traveling, pretty much anywhere, and also at any time, because they also offer 24-7 support to all their clients. And they also have a great new threat protection feature which increases your security even more. Go to nordvpn.com slash knowledge to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no reason why you shouldn't try NordVPN today. Now, back to the video. In the three initial cases we saw, we can tell that the transcontinental feature is, in fact, incredibly important for these countries. Not because of the transcontinentality itself, but because of what it represents. In Panama's case, the existence of the Panama Canal. In Egypt, the Suez, although that one is mostly not connected, as they would still control the canal even without holding the Sinai, and with Turkey, the control of the Bosporus Strait and its military and commercial importance between the Black and Mediterranean Seas. There are only two other contiguous transcontinental countries, Russia and Kazakhstan. Russia's intercontinentality is between Europe and Asia. Russia stretches over a vast expanse of Eastern Europe and Northern Asia. Its Asian territory is sparsely populated though. The vast majority of its population, around 80%, lives within its European portion. The capital of Moscow is in Europe, as are most of their largest cities. The vast Asian territories they control were incorporated into the Tsardom of Russia in the 17th century by conquest, colonization, or simply expansion into areas that were empty and ruled by no one. Russia is mostly considered a European country as its historical, cultural, ethnical and political ties are to Europe, but we should not overlook its Asian lands and the people that live there. And then Kazakhstan. It's mostly located in Central Asia and only a small portion of its territory is across of the Ural River, which technically makes it also a part of Eastern Europe. Just less than 1 million people live there and the country only has 15 million, so it is still a significant part of their territory in that regard. In opposition to what happens in Russia, the country's culture is essentially Central Asian, although it does, or at least did, have a lot of European influence throughout its history, with large movements of Russian settlers when it was a part of the Soviet Union and the earlier Russian Empire. And what about those other transcontinental countries in the middle tone blue from that initial map? I'm not going to cover all of them in detail, but I'm going to go over a few specific cases that illustrate the ways in which many of them achieve their trade of intercontinentality or transcontinentality. The first mention has to go to Georgia and Azerbaijan, which are actually in the lightest blue, but which are, in my view, contiguous transcontinental countries as the first ones that we saw, but they are not usually presented as such due to some disagreements about where Europe begins slash ends in that eastern border, but Azerbaijan has five of its districts north of the Greater Caucasus watershed and thus geographically is in Europe, and Georgia also has three municipalities in the same region. Portugal, Spain, and Italy are simple. They simply have islands that, despite being very close to their home continental territory, are technically already a part of the African continent. The same happens with Yemen or Greece with its islands of Rhodes, etc. Although Portugal's case isn't only due to Madeira technically being a part of Africa, but also arguably due to a number of islands of of the Azores archipelago being on top of the North America tectonic plate. The same happens with Trinidad and Tobago. The southern half of Trinidad lies on the Southern American plate, while the rest is on the Caribbean North American plate. But tectonic plates don't necessarily define continental limits, so take of that what you will. While France and Britain are on this list also due to overseas islands, but which are located much further away throughout the world, like the Netherlands with their Caribbean islands. Norway has islands and territory in Antarctica, as is the case with Chile or 
or Australia. Although Chile also owns the oceanic Easter Islands, the same as Ecuador with the Galapagos or Japan with three remote islands. And Australia also has the Christmas and Cocoa Islands, which are geographically associated with Southeast Asia. While Denmark technically owns Greenland, a part of North America. And speaking of North America, the United States are transcontinental due to their island possessions in the Pacific. And Venezuela, for instance, has islands which are part of the Caribbean and therefore exist in both South and North America. Indonesia currently controls Western New Guinea, which is culturally associated with Oceania and geologically a part of the Australian continental landmass. So we understand that a lot of countries are non-contiguously transcontinental because either they have close by islands, which just happen to be closer to the adjacent continent, or they still control remnants of their colonial empire, which remain part of their territory up to today, spread across the world. There are also countries and especially empires that used to be transcontinental throughout history. The Empire of Alexander the Great is a good example of that. The Empire of the Huns, the many emirates and caliphates of Muslim powers of North Africa and the Middle East, such as the Fatimid Caliphate, who was actually in three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and many others throughout history. So those are a few of the transcontinental or intercontinental countries in the world. Understanding the difference between those who are so in a contiguous way and those which are still transcontinental, but in a non-contiguous way, simply due to islands or other external territories they have across the world. Also remembering to pay attention to some specific cases which are only technically transcontinental, like Portugal, whose characterization of Madeira as being African is, despite correct, not that relevant for the territory's culture or way of existing. Learning what it means to be a transcontinental country and how or why some of these have managed to do so and what that sometimes means for them. Thanks so much for watching this video, subscribe if you want and leave a comment with your video suggestions. Just like this video was taken from a comment in a previous video, your idea might get chosen as well. Remember to try out NordVPN if you want to be safer online and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.